Now I love mock scrapes, and if any of you have looked at my YouTube channel, it seems like all the B-roll we show a box are coming in and hitting this fancy looking mock scrape here. And we'll start off by, you know, where do you put a mock scrape? And a lot of people ask, uh, where should I set my mock scrapes up? How many should I have? And my short answer is, very definitively, is wherever you have a bow stand. Put one mock scrape up. It kind of does me no good if I have a mock scrape in this location and I can't shoot at it. It becomes that high of an attraction. A lot of the trails end up intersecting. We have a big X of trails right here. And so the same reason that you put a stand right in this location is the same reason that you would set up a mock scrape. You're trying to define movement. Just getting inventory boxes is just part of the equation. I want to know that these deer are actually being attracted to the stand location. It becomes a great level of attraction for a short bow shot. I think we're 22, 23 yards from the stand right here, which is perfect. And so when we're setting this up, that's a big consideration. And how many more should you have that? And I, I don't think you should have any more because if I have another mock scrape over here in a random spot for a camera location, I'm potentially pulling deer movement away from this spot in front of that stand to a spot where I don't have a stand. So very easy if you have, I've seen a hundred mock scrapes created around a food plot with the thought that more mock scrapes equals more bucks on your land. Folks, it just defines movement. Helps you get an inventory of those bucks in the area, but at the same time, it actually attracts it, attracts those deer to this location and you can get a shot. So that's why I really love running mock scrapes. Now the type of scrapes you use, I'm not using anything fancy. I'm not trying to sell you anything at all. I don't make the paracord or nylon rope that attaches this, but that's all we buy. I mean, so we're talking pennies per site. We're really not spending a lot of money. And I'm not using any fancy scents because, and I'll touch this up here, because guess what? Deer don't smell it up here. I can put my handprint up here. This is one of our most important locations. I could care less if I touch this thing right here. It really doesn't matter because right here is where they're rubbing their preorbital gland scent on. What you'll find with these mock scrapes is kind of interesting is they don't actually make a scrape all except for maybe three, four weeks out of the year when they'd be very aggressive during the rut. The rest of the time, 365 days, they're coming and rubbing their preorbital gland scent on here. And we even say whether it's during the summer or during the fall, when a big buck, when a big buck uses this and leaves a scent with his antlers, we have a video of Kermit. He actually moves his head around after and goes this way. During the summer, he's doing the same thing. He moves his head around and goes this way. We have Eileen, a buck we had last year, moves his head around after he leaves scent. After they leave the scent on here, it's almost sacred. This is a calling card for other deer in the area. More deer, more leave more scent. And if you're thinking about adding some scent to this, what's interesting, I'll see people add urine to something like this. When was the last time you ever saw a deer lift its leg and pee upward, up into the scrape? It just doesn't happen. And then if you leave any kind of gel, powder, any kind of spray on this licking branch, you're just covering up the deer's natural scent. It's interesting with deer. Uh, biologist John Zoga in the past, he had told me that a bread factory, we go by, smell bread, they go by, smell the ingredients. Just completely different. And they could actually rank and order which one smelled strongest, which one smelled light, lighter. If you don't believe me, think about beagles and running rabbits. So a rabbit go, runs by a woodlot, beagle comes out, they know immediately to turn without seeing the rabbit, without seeing a track, no snow. They turn the way that that rabbit now, a good beagle, not all of them, but they turn the exact way that that rabbit ran and they can tell that by smell. They're noisy. We just can't comprehend this. So they're leaving the scent right here. And that's critical to understand that the more scent that accumulates on this, the stronger this level of attraction become and becomes and the more it defines movement. And as far as the number, if they're diluting the amount of scent they leave here because they have so many choices in the area, then this isn't going to be that strong of an attraction, no different than putting 15 water holes on 40 acres. You dilute the power of each water hole. So I encourage one at every stand location and only at your stand locations. Maybe you have a random mock scrape in a central location on the property you can't get to. Maybe you have one in a food plot system where you can't hunt with a bow and you just wanna see how many deer or how many bucks are coming in there, but that's more the rare exception. Now how to build these, you can see this mock scrape is about belly high, waist high, somewhere around there. I want every deer that comes by here to contribute in leaving its scent. That's fawns, does, young bucks, and old bucks. It's directly over the trail. So every time they come through here, they leave their scent. They almost have to hit their head if they don't. I like using something natural. We use vines a lot. Be very careful it doesn't have leaves of three on it and you're grabbing a poison ivy vine. 
but we're using vines. And I like this because there's a lot of the flexibility in a vine. A lot of, if you've ever tried to grab a vine and try to bend it and break it, now when this one's dry, it might be, it might be able to be broken just by snapping it and bending it over. But these vines last a long time. We've had them last seven or eight years in the trees. I've been using mock shapes like this going back into the 2000s. So I like this, you know, another one if you're up north. I love jack pine branches. We get a branch, mock scrape, vine mock scrape. I'm making those about three quarter inch to one inch in diameter. That seems to be that balance of too skinny, it breaks too often, the deer don't notice it, and too fat that it's almost intimidating or too thick. You talk about an inch and a half diameter, inch and a quarter, two inch, or just too big. I don't think they, I don't see typically after walking a thousand client properties that they're hitting big vines coming down like that. There's always a happy spot. So I'm looking at some type of material, jack pine, has a lot of flexibility to it. Hemlock isn't too bad. White oak's another really good one. So you might not have any of vines. If you're up north and you don't have much of a choice, poplar can be great. So think about materials, trees, vines, conifer, that deer are actually naturally scraping and rubbing. That's your answer. Now I see rope, I've seen rope. I've seen thousands of rope scrapes. It's more of a fad or a gimmick because there's nothing that can actually beat the natural scent and natural ability of a vine, a white oak branch, a jack pine branch to actually attract deer and blend into the, into the surrounding. These vines, remember deer want to rub their preorbital glands on it. There has to be some rigidity that they can actually push against. I find a lot of times when people are using rope or some other material, look at where it's coming from. It's usually a sold product. That's the hunting industry. Something might work better but they're selling a product to you so they can get your money and the marketing hype around that and saying that's better when really it boils down in this case something like this natural is always best i'm using a five to six foot branch in a typical situation you can see this one right here is tied to a branch that's above it and we have approximately five six inches of rope that gets this vine to the right height in this location Sometimes I'll take a mock scrape like this and I'll attach it between two trees and there might be a rope going across 10, 12 feet up. In that case, it's just suspended in the air over a, over a scrape. I've seen people use, and you look at it in terms of extremes, I've seen mock scrapes that are this long or the branch, the licking branch is this long. It's just hanging there in midair. It's, it doesn't look natural to the deer. Deer don't like using those. So in a case where it's very open here, it's going up to a branch. This looks like another branch hanging down. So if I'm attaching it to a rope going across and I don't have any branches or anything else that's in that area to make it look natural, then what I'm doing is I'm making that vine or branch six or seven or even eight feet long. So it's not the opposite of just a stick hanging there looking unnatural. Then it's out of their view. They really don't care. And so again, if it's out in the open, I'm using a three quarter inch to one inch diameter. I like the vines the best because they seem soft, porous, they hold scent, they're flexible, they last a long time. One of the most natural, most common used perennial scrapes I see on any property in any state. And, uh, and then I'm using a taller one if it's out in the open. I'm using a little bit shorter one if we have branches like this to hide it in. Then finally, I'm putting it over a very flat spot. If you can grade it out a little bit, we'll, we'll use a shovel sometimes or a spade. We always carry a garden rake in the side by side to really rough it up. I'm clearing a pad that might be three to four feet in diameter initially just to get that started. I often pee into the scrape myself just to add a little scent, but I don't even think that's really important. It's just that calling card a lot of times of that fresh earth. And then we're starting our scrapes most of the time in the end of June. And that's the perfect time to put your trail cameras out. Maybe you like to keep them out year round. We have a lot that are out year round, but that's a perfect time because you can start to recognize individual bucks that you had pattern last year. So I wanna see that those bucks are alive, that they're still in those same patterns. And a lot of times I'm putting these mock scrapes purely in fall locations. I could care less for those deer at during the summer. We have a big buck venti that sticks around here a lot during the fall. I'd like to see them right now. We're getting occasional pictures. We just had a video a little bit ago in another location on a mock scrape. But other than that, it's really important that these bucks are here during the fall and that's why I'm setting them up on fall movements, not summer movements. You're going to get more uh, infrequent pictures. And that's okay. Every time they come through, they're telling you, hey, I'm going to be back during the fall. You know it's a fall setup. And these mock scrapes can be incredible. And the great part is they're virtually free. Very, very easy to create. 
Um, I encourage you to watch you know, the thousands of hours of uh, B-roll that we have on our, on our YouTube channel. I've been doing this for a very long time. You can look up mock scrapes. I think if you look on my playlist in, in YouTube, I might have close to 40 mock scrape videos. And, and again, I'm not trying to sell any products here. These areas like this become so important that in the back right here, I have an Exodus render camera and I had a, have a lift camera. We want the B-roll of the HD video of a buck coming in here and working this. And then I want the cell cam to tell me what's going on because this is a very important hunting location. I'm not in here changing the card that often. In fact, Dylan and I were here last Monday. We changed the card, didn't have any cards to put back in. I tell Dylan, I'll come back tomorrow. Well, I can imagine it'll be a week from now maybe when I put the card back here. We just came back here tonight. It's supposed to rain a couple days. I'm gone for the weekend. So that turns into two weeks all of a sudden. But we have the two cameras running here often because we want those cell cam pictures. That's giving us real time information of what's going on in this location. And then the HD video is also telling us which way they're coming from, what's behind it, if a doe comes through. So it limits our number of pictures. We can keep these cameras in the same spot on a set of batteries for a very, very long time, several months or more. And, uh, and it all boils down to this mock scrape. Again, I can touch this. We're putting mock scrapes like this out a lot where we're actually handling the mock scrape and we have deer hitting it within a day. So we find there's our scent on here doesn't really linger for that long as we're putting a handprint on there. But that's how we set up the mock scrapes, a flat surface right here, right in the middle of the trail, right in front of the bow stand, five to eight feet, depending on how open that setting is, three quarter inch to one inch in diameter. We're using vines, jack pine branches, white oak, maybe even hemlock, Aspen up north, just depends on what's going on. Beach branches can be really good in the area. Deer love to scrape and uh, under beach and then rub beach, beach too. And finally, just you're really limiting the number that are on your property to just the necessities. Again, if you have 100 scrapes out here, which one are they gonna hit? I want them hitting the one purely in front of my stand. And I'll leave you with this. If I have a natural scrape that's off this line of movement out here on the field edge over here, I don't want deer being pulled away from my shot. I literally go cut that scrape down if it's within that 50, 60 yard bubble of here. I want all the deer to hit this scrape in front of my stand. When they come into this in the fall, what's pretty cool, they're focused purely on this. They're not looking at any trail cameras in the tree and certainly they're not looking you up in the tree stand either. They're paying attention to this. It can be a great way to get an in inexperienced hunter a shot because they're not focusing on the tree stand, they're focusing on the scrape. The cool thing is they throw, they focus on this seven days a week, 365 fawns, does, and bucks. I encourage you to add these to your land if you haven't done so already. They're a lot of fun. Best of all, they're free. Enjoy them, not only this hunting season, but this off season too.